SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Okay, get good on here so much. Good to see all of you. I don't see no teenagers here. <laughs> but I know you, all of you have a, a wealth of uh, knowledge and information in your minds. And uh, I'm no spring chicken myself. And I just want to pass out information sort of in an educational process to create knowledge and mend those troublesome areas that many people have not heard of, don't understand, or don't want, don't want to understand. I'm an educator by profession. And I want to add, I am the uh, great, great grandson of Chief Red Crow, who I'll be making reference to in my presentation. One of the last chiefs of the Fish Eater Clan, Mamuyiks, to arrive at Blackfoot Crossing. They all waited for my great, great grandfather. And uh, he was quite uh, instrumental in the demands that he proposed but were not lived up to. And he never really signed anything. And he never really agreed to anything. <coughs> and so with books written, it's always from the non-Blackwood perspective. And uh, can you just grab me that book? If people want to read further, this book entitled the True Spirit and, in, and Original Intent of Treaty 7 by Walter Hillebrand, Dorothy First Rider, and Sarah Carter is about the closest to the interpretation of how we see the uh, treaty and how we interpret it. And so I used the visual Ninastakul, Valley River. This is our timber limits and very limited of what we used to have in terms of our traditional Blackfoot territory. Prior to the day of September 22nd, 1877. So let's say September 1st of 1877, we traveled in our traditional territory starting from the south, the Yellowstone River to the other side of the uh, Continental Divide, all the way to Big River, as they call it, my elders, North Saskatchewan River, and the Sand Hills, and straight down into Montana. Imagine overnight we lost all that, and the hunting, and the camping. And in 1884, we were put on reservations, reserves, no access, no more buffalo. Thanks to the hunters, they got paid for it. And there's books here, and I didn't put there. The Amer American and the Hudson Bur uh, Fur Trading Company, companies, some of the Métis people, the Americans in general, that just slaughtered the buffalo. And so, it created a starvation time. But let me begin on treaty. How do you do this here? <clears throat> oh. Okay, so there's uh, several historical accounts of Treaty 7 agreement between the government and Prairie First Nations, and especially, more specifically, Siksikeit Sitapi, Blackfoot people. But none of these are from Aboriginal perspective. It was only lately. Everything was told by lawyers, government officials, anthropologists, archaeologists, 
everybody that spoke on our behalf. And just lately, we started speaking on our own behalf. The elders of each First Nations, however, maintain an oral history of the events. And that's a big thing to understand, the oral and written documents of how we've transferred oral stories. It's, it's the story that I will recite a little bit later. The Blackfoot-speaking uh, tribes begin their explanation of what the treaty means by explaining initiative or peacemaking. We have no Blackfoot word of giving land away. We don't. In Nitsipulsen. In this is where you create peace. We're doing in this tea ceremonies with other tribes prior to this government and Indian discussion. We've had in this tea from time immemorial of enemy tribes, of competing tribes always been there and it's through, through a ceremonial process ceremony tp pipe smudge everything all that that was respected the same way before british common law came across the atlantic ocean of how colonizers monarchy vatican had agreements through scrolls they stamped and signed. Well, this is how we did business here in a historical way. So for the Canadian treaty makers, Treaty 7 was something that was more narrowly a legal agreement, later interpreted to have been a land surrender. At that discussion, those few days in Blackwood Crossing, it was not a, 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 a meeting of the chief councils, the chiefs. It was not a meeting where they gathered, okay, this is how much sections and this will give this waterway in the mountains. There was none of that. It was strictly, all right, we'll keep the peace and we'll not cut your hair off. We'll let you pass through this territory. We will not harm your kids, your women, men, whatever. It was peace, peace. There's no mention of land ever <clears throat> from the chiefs, the interpreters were brief to swing that as a land discussion. And I'll get to some of the names that my ancestors informed me that did a bad job and pardon my <coughs> Mars language screwed us big time. I'm going to try this. I don't know if I have time to uh, get this. Who's a techie here to put this quick five minute YouTube? Historical Crossing, and we are on our way to the site of where Treaty 7 was signed. I'm really looking forward to it. This is something that's so close to where I went to school, and like middle school and high school, and I've never been here before, and there's so much history here, so I'm looking forward to it. The medicine wheel, thousands of years ago, already set the template for what was going to happen. The newcomers are coming. From that direction, the rising of the sun. Few more suns and they will be here. Now we're standing on this ground where, just over to my right, where they signed the treaty in 1877. It's that side where Clarence was telling us they had all the cannons set up and over here at Blackfoot Crossing where the river is actually shallow enough to where they could cross the river. It's almost surreal to actually think of how how vast the camps were because you always, like you think about it in your head 
Um, but it's so much bigger than that. So, when Trini was coming, a police camped here. So as you stand here, take all these houses away, take all these trees away, just look at the camp. As in such a big camp. A Chutina, it's our sea, and the stone is camped on that's way on that side. The Bloods, Blackfoot, South Pigan, Pigan. And our modern treaty tribe, the Goban, some of them, the society people, came and camped with us. What if treaty doesn't happen? What's the other alternative? We go to battle. Just behind the hill, there's 10,000 warriors ready to battle. It's not a sense of, I'm a landowner, no. It's a sense of the Creator put everything here for all of us. If we respect the protocol, if we respect each other to help each other, like the two of wampum at the Mohawk, you sail two stream, you help each other, but you don't jump in a boat. No, you don't belong there, you sail that. You make sure you're in that same direction, helping each other. They said, go for it. It's a bomb, you will have to deal with this. So Crawford had a big decision. I have a big responsibility for my people. He went back and told the other chiefs that people had to let them. The interpreter didn't, didn't even speak. One and got loaded the night before, and he wasn't in any position to translate. They had to get Le Haro, he couldn't even speak English, let alone sporadic Blackfoot. The people in the back must have been trying to prevent themselves from laughing. I would have laughed if I was there. <laughs> Crowfoot made a speech about the future. He says, we are numerous. Have pity on us. I was the father of my people, my children. You will be the father of my children. Have pity on them and take care of them. That's what Kofut said. It's a little longer, I'm just abbreviating, <laughs> simplifying it. I believe Kofut was very sad. That is the story from the people that stood here. Now you've heard it. <laughs> you won't find that in books. It's, it's, it's five minutes, gets to the point. If we didn't sign the treaty, we would have gone to battle. And some were ready to go to battle. There was no alternative. It, it pushed the agenda. Either give up your land and we'll give you this. And all the chiefs talked about it. A very close majority, let's keep peace. We already smoked a pipe. We already prayed. We cannot shoot these government representatives and Northwest Mounted Police. And you heard cannons. That's quite intimidating. And you're signing a treaty. You're telling us to keep the peace but at the same time you're on his land and you have the cannons on top of 
the hill there. Several of them. Is that a good negotiating process? <laughs> a lot of chiefs thought they think not. So the book here that I brought, I cross-reference with this like, like, Wikipedia. For you people, on your phones, and I know all of you are tech savvy, Google this site, Treaty 7. I cross-referenced this encyclopedia information plus that book, and I took out some of the stuff that were a little bit off base on this encyclopedia. Other than that, it looked like they took the information out of that, so it was easier to download. So that way, at least, you got something to go home and, you know, put it on tonight, and if you fall asleep, well, 5 o'clock in the morning, tune back in and that way will wake you up too, you know. <laughs> so the agreement was between the Crown and several, and mainly Blackfoot First Nation bands, governments, in what is today southern portion of Alberta. The idea of developing treaties for Blackfoot lands was brought to the Blackfoot uh, by Chief Crowfoot and by John McDougall. He was a minister, a Jesuit, in 1875. McDougall had already enticed Crowfoot two years to sign a treaty. McDougall did not go to the other Bikani and Sky Bikani and the Blood or Ghana bands. He went to Crowfoot. He knew Crowfoot's uncle, Red Crow, was a pretty tough guy. So two years had before, because Laird and other government people had approached McDougal. And McDougal had an inside track with the Stonies and Sarcees. But he didn't speak Blackfoot. He didn't speak four or five other languages. It was concluded on September 22, 1877, and September 4, 1877. The agreement was signed at Blackfoot Crossing. So I know a lot of you like traveling. There's a Blackfoot Historical Center, nice place, in Clooney. Your coordinator, director, book over there, they'll be more than happy to give you a tour. It's an all-day thing. It might be two days. This is a glimpse of what they have over there. The agreement was signed at Blackfoot Crossing of the Bow River at the present day Six Guy Nation Reserve, approximately 100 kilometers, 62 miles east of Calgary. Treaty 7 is one of the uh, 11 numbered treaties signed between First Nations and the Crown between 1871 and 1921. The treaty established uh, the limited area of land for the tribes, a reserve. Promised annual payments, provis provisions are both from the Crown to the tribes and promised continued hunting and trapping rights on the tract surrendered. In exchange, the tribes ceded their rights to their traditional territory of which they had earlier been recognized as owners. They never ceded. Never. That is the federal legal interpretation. Oh, we gave up this to go keep continue hunting and provisions. These are documentation by Ottawa. The five nations were Blackwood, Bikani, Sarsi, and Crees in the blood. They were nomadic population. I don't like the word nomadic, but I'll use it. They moved about, but they knew exactly where to camp on their four to eight seasonal camping areas, even more, which allowed them to move freely following the buffalo herds from which they were gained a lot, where they gained a lot of their resources and were able to live. The five nations owned their lands and used them for hunting on, uh, grounds as well as for, uh, for settlement areas. The whole mass of buffalo. And thanks to all those people that shot the buffalo, start starving us. Well, we got them starving and their numbers dwindled by smallpox outbreaks. Let's make them sign a treaty and put them on reservations or reserves 
And that's exactly what they did. And we're still stuck on the blood reserve. Pikani Siksikai. I'm Skabi Pikani. The Canadian government wanted to build a railway, but in order to proceed, they had to acquire the land from the indigenous people. The government brought forward the idea of a treaty to the indigenous people who resided on the land on the plains that was needed for the railroad. There were already treaties in place between other indigenous groups and the government. This was the seventh treaty. CP Rail. Get those savages out of the way. Make them sign treaties. If they're not coherent and they don't understand it, we'll take whatever. And we will say they agreed to it. Let's get this train going to the Pacific Coast before the Great Northern Trail of the United States beats us to the Pacific Ocean. The Great Train Race. All the passes. Crowsness Pass, Calgary Pass. Those underlying tendencies. They never said anything about the train. None whatsoever. The white, you sign this, the great white grandmother will give you this land. And my great great grandfather, Red Crow, said, What do you mean? And who's this great great grand grandmother? I got my own grandmother. How can she give us land when it's already ours? That is still perplexing today. And the so called terra, terra nullius. I don't believe in it. It's just a bullish, brutal, hostile, whatever you want to interpret it, takeover. And Red Crow didn't like it. He said, how can one great white grandmother have so many great great and grandkids? Who is she? You people talk about. Oh, it's on our medal, on our medallions. So we don't know her and we don't want to get to know her. Treaty 7 was signed in September between the Crown, the Crown, the government, through the monarchy representatives. So-called Canada was still under the imperialistic colonial rule of the Crown of England. So they're calling the shots way over there to hear, to hear, to the Prime Minister. And so Bikani, Stony, Nakoda, Sotina, the negotiation of the treaty took place between David Laird, Lieutenant Governor of Northwest Territories, and James McLeod, Commissioner of Northwest Mounted Police, who were first acting as the Crown's treaty commissioners. The First Nations acting as the Crown's treaty commissioners to, and representatives were largely from the Blackfoot. Con the First Nations acting as the uh, representatives were largely from the Blackfoot Confederacy, due to their inhibiting the majority of the land being sought. And this is where it wasn't really Treaty Seven; it was Blackfoot Treaty. Just lately, it's being entitled Blackfoot Treaty. It was all our territory. All the other tribes were not indigenous to this. And it causes some splits here, but that's okay. Truth and facts have to come out on top. And so the facts of this is this was Blackfoot territory. It was all Blackfoot territory, traditionally. But as earlier, 1875, they started manipulating the process. How can we get the Blackfoots to simmer down and more or less lock them on the reserves? There was also discussion around annual payments, reserve land, and education. The indigenous leaders and their nations were greatly concerned about continuing to be able to hunt and fish across all the land. Crowfoot waited for the arrival of Red Crow, the leader of Kainai Nation and a trusted friend of McLeod, before making any decision with the treaty. Once Red Crow arrived, Blackfoot explained, Crowfoot explained to him to the best of his ability about what he believed the treaty to be about. Crowfoot was upset. Said, so this is not good. Matsuka, you. 
I'm camping by Yellowstone River, all my people, and the Fish Eater Clan, Mamuics, were one, if the, the largest band of all the other bands of the four tribes. Lots of camps there. He didn't like it. He felt something not good about it. And so everybody waited for him because the Mamuics were pretty fierce. And he said, kind of more or less, you brought me all this way to, 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 for this? It doesn't sound good. And he was directed to McDougal, the priest, Jerry Potts and Jimmy Jock Bird, the half Indians. He didn't like it at all. And so the opinions of the treaty differs across Canada. And this is a kind of small writing. Their interpretations are guided by the support of the Crown. And the Canadian government viewed it as a contract. And the difference between a contract and a covenant, that is the covenant is conceived under a deity and therefore a spiritual context. So deity and covenant and contract. They view it as a contract, not a, and most part of conclusion, the treaty, uh, that Treaty 7 was a peace treaty rather than a land surrender. Treaty 7 nations all said that that was, I don't know what's wrong with my computer here. The First Nations agreed to share the land with Canadian newcomers in return for Crown, Crown's promises which entitled annuity payments, education, medical, ammunition, assistance, farming, ranching, all that, and that's from the book, The True Spirit and Intent. And our sacred places, just a few of them. Today, the annuity payment, if I could quickly go back to that. We were given five bucks back then. I still get five bucks today. It'll cost me $35 from my house for gas to go pick up my five bucks. <laughs> Think about it. Education has never been fulfilled. The health, ammunition. Right now, we can't even farm on the blood reserve. The government put a stop to it, stop giving my grandfather who can drive a tractor. In the late 50s, 60s, government told banks do not give seed or fertilizer or machinery loans. Since then, we have non Indians coming on the reserve and all those truckers. Today, the blood reserve, all those non native farmers take out $26 million and they have concerns of being racist. Look at who's feeding the city, your family, your kids going to off to college, university. And most of that money is injected in this city, 26 million. And so medical care, I just had a niece we we're gonna bury. Went to the hospital twice, sent her back with pills again. They found her in her house last week. Where is the medical treaty right to this? I'm pushing this agenda to today of how we're still being treated. So I get asked, you Indians don't pay treaty. And I tell them, give us our, all our land back that you got for free, and maybe I might pay taxes. So I don't buy into that non Indians paying non-taxes. You guys didn't pay for the land, and you've made billions upon billions on our traditional Blackfoot territory, and I get five bucks. Think about it. There's no dang way I'm going to pay taxes because you didn't pay for the land. This place here, all over, and we got these little reserves. So I don't conclude on that. The treaties and anybody, you could get anybody from the Blackfoot Confederacy to start to talk about treaties, <laughs> they're gonna talk like me, and maybe even worse. It was a giant ripoff. We got the bad end of the deal, even in 2022. So I'll stop there, because this is actually a three-day, four-day presentation, and uh, I need water before smoke comes out of here. You know? <laughs> Thank you. So, I'll, any questions, you know? I'll come up and moderate. Maybe. Sure.
I don't need to say no, I don't mind. And we can get up and okay. get after the question. Put it on that picture there. Uh -huh. Back to the picture, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, folks, uh, a lot of food for thought there. Uh, so we're going to start the question period right now. I just want to uh, tell you also that, you know, that think about Truth and reconciliation, and it all ties into to the treaties and how indigenous people were treated over the years. It's not something that's going to fix itself in one or maybe even two generations. But it's a start when you when you when you hear the stories. You can appreciate what the indigenous people have experienced. And I think th th especially the, our younger generations, they would learn in school what, what went on. They will have a different outlook on how to uh, evolve. And hopefully someday we'll have a society that can that can that doesn't have to rely on on government help all the time to they be self self sufficient like like the indigenous people were before the white people arrived. Anyway, uh, I invite you to come up and uh, and if you can line up, if you could move also, you can line up uh, along the wall here. That would be that would be really good, so you don't have to walk in front of the. Uh, camera. So go ahead, Henning. Hi, Mike. Henning Mundel is my name. Um, you did, like uh, Knut said, give us a lot of food for thought. I wonder, though, if you could outline a little bit, what is the relationship between the BTAP, the Blood Tribe Agricultural Program, and the uh, blood, the community. The, uh, I was involved with the VTAP as a um, elected official, 8183, uh, to what it is now. And it took a lot of negotiations. That part where VTAP lies, we almost last, lost it because of a bogus vote that uh, federal government in Indian Affairs. And so we do want to lose that. So we wanted to have a, a farm uh, operating entity to grow timothy, barley, you know, good uh, uh, feed and to sell to different countries, even in uh, this country, uh, to, to create jobs, create economy for the reserve because uh, we were dirt poor. And so that's an economic venture. And those people that go 509, you could travel down there. Nobody will shoot your tires off, you know, just to <laughs> go through there. And you'll see all the irrigation. Uh, a very uh, sophisticated plan at my time, just initial discussions and how it's grown. Uh, we brought an elder to pray on the land that it'd be a successful project. So it's it has uh, created jobs and some income for the tribe. And, uh, but here's the other thing, on BTAP, uh, we still can't farm it. The non-permit farmers, white farmers are coming on, on that irrigation project to farm it, they pay. And this is where, I guess, sort of an armchair thing. We'll collect the money since we can't farm. So we lease uh, the, the farming out to them and, uh, you know, and you know they pay for the pivot, the irrigation use, the canal that was negotiated that comes off uh, St. Mary's uh, uh, Canal, and then actually, you know, so we had to come from another angle to make money instead of just the money leaving the reserve. So at least a portion of that is staying on the reserve through these uh, ventures. Uh, um, to uh, Korea, Japan, some of the Pacific Rim countries. And it's been going for about, I'd say, 
a little bit uh, towards the end of uh, 1980s, it really flourished. And so we pride ourselves that uh, the feed that goes out, there's no foxtail, no weeds, it's pure feed. Going to Japan and those places have small countries to feed their poultry, their hogs, their agriculture, because they don't have that kind. So that was uh, a lot of thinking by each chief and council at, along the way um, and uh, with consultants um, to do that. So it was kind of thinking out of the box at that time. And I'm proud of it, but uh, I, I would like to see our own people farm the land. That way they take uh, income home with them and then pay the permit lease to, to VTAB, Blood Tribe Agricultural Products. But now it's all non-native farmers. S same old picture, but we figured a way out how to keep the money like the regular farming all through or from this end to way out to hill spring 26 million average is a lot of money if that was on reserve i'd be a wealthy man and buy you guys supper every day <laughs> 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 Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you so much for being here. We've known each other forever from the university. Yeah. Must be four decades. Pretty close. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm curious what um, what rules are there still in place that keep people from people from the reserve from farming? Is it st are there still the rules that the banks? Uh, don't give you the fertilizer, won't give you the loans, and if so, how can those rules be changed? Would that be through members of parliament? Would that be through talking directly to the prime minister? How, how, how could that be changed? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You know, it, it can be changed. If the federal government and all these national banks had a heart, had a consideration instead of being politically motivated. The government back in the day did tell the banks around here, do not give out any more farm loans to, uh, um, sorry, to, um, to Blood Tribe members. And so that, back then there was a little bit of loans given out, not a lot in the 50s, little 60s and it just stopped all these machinery they were old but they were still workable you could see tractors just sitting all over the reserve old swathers old mowers just sitting there because you couldn't farm your own land now in order to farm anybody on the reserve to farm their own land they have to come up with their own collateral but you can't get collateral because you have to go to the bank so some save and save, we have about two or three, and they're really sweating it every year out of their own pocket, you know, paying for their little machinery. And so that was done because the word was, and, and I'm not gonna speak for other tribes, but the Blackfoots and especially the Bloods, the Bloods cannot get wealthy. Then we cannot control them if they get wealthy. That was the idea on behind it. There's documentation. But you go to British Columbia, they did not sign treaties. Those that have traveled to Vancouver, the ocean front, Musqueam Band, all the other bands, they own the waterfront. And they didn't sign a treaty. My brother Clarence Louis Osoyas, very successful leader, they're making money lots of money from the ocean whatever they have their own 40 mall type stores you know and and so now it's, it's casino well let's try we can't even get a casino yet because certain casino groups are undermining that so it's it's constantly frustrating to get the access, but to answer your question, the feds can change all this. 
the banks know how much grain comes out of there because they give farm loans to everybody else except us. But they won't. I could go in there and ask for a loan of 500 to buy a tractor and a cedar, just for starters. I will not get it. Because they're gonna say, you have no collateral. Well, my collateral is the grain or the feed that I'm gonna get to buy the fertilizer and the, the seed. So we can't even get any startup costs for seed to get started. They're not allowed. But you gotta pay out of your own. And there's two or three and they're hanging in there, hanging in there. And the tribe isn't helping them out either. That's the other, another story. I'll say that in December SACPA. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Mark Edel. So there's no doubt that the government goal was assimilation through the uh, residential schools, etc. And uh, now with the truth and recon reconciliation, uh, what, what do you see the future of the blood tribe? In, uh, let's say, in 100 years, do you think the simulation is going to start happening? Or wh how, what is your vision, and what would you like to see in the next 100 years or so? Just two, two or three points there. You saw education as one of the treaty rights. Well, they gave us education in 1884 residential schools. They thought, okay, we'll give you treaty rights, education, but now you have to go to residential schools. I'm a fourth residential school survivor, and in a different way, not only survive, but I'm not dead. In an unmarked grave. I'm, I'm here, You're, people are hearing from me. Look at how many didn't make it under treaty, treaty. The treaty killed people through that process. I see a way out here. If I win the lotto or save my money for the next 10, 20 years, buying land here off res, the bank will give me a loan. Then when I get that loan, then maybe then I could then turn and buy a tractor offers reserve to drive it on my land. Cattle loan, same thing. So it's almost like I have to move off or buy land off the reserve, then it's considered the collateral, the land, good enough for the banks. Why I say that, I have a daughter that brought, bought her house. And I have a lot of friends that bought houses. They're paying mortgage, they're paying city taxes. They're like one of you. The only difference is that they're blood tribe, pagan tribe members, Siksikai, is their language and their culture. Economically, they're paying. And get this, they're paying taxes too. So something has to change. And I've thought about, that's an excellent question, 100 years, my grandkids, how are they going to survive? Because on the reserve, you're not eligible for too much if you're not related to council or the chief. And I'm being sarcastic. Nepotism is a way of survival on the reserve. It's, it, it's just there. It's kind of almost normal, and it shouldn't be. But in terms of, you know, I think, you know, you take oil and gas. I got 96 oil and gas by my house. I don't know if that's why I have diabetes. I know I breathe something. 18 years ago, Knut knows about that story. And uh, it's a dire straight situation. Imagine everybody gets up 
The biggest employer is tribal administrative jobs, 48 departments, school jobs. That's why I turned to education. Got educated, became a teacher, principal, vice principal. And from there, the benefit package, saving. Well, get this, all my money that I saved, you know, on one pocket, uh, 68,000, 10 years ago, I'm down to 48,000. Because the stocks went like this. And I know you guys' packages are like that. I lost 20,000 in 10 years. And I ain't getting any younger. Is it gonna take 10 years just to reach my investment? So there's other factors. I thought I'd be smart and safe and safe investing. It's gone the other way around. I lost money. Trying to be like the stock guy off the reserve. Ten. You know, where do I go? I ain't gonna get assistance from the tribe. I ain't gonna get assistance from Feds, heck, next year, am I going to lose another 10? Then my investment is down to 38. And then as I, what if it's zero? I've lost all my money. But all the financial consultants, invest there, invest there, the, the mild, the secure, and you know, high risk and whatever, you, you guys all heard that thing. I did the, the safety thing. <laughs> it still didn't work. So I'm answering your question a lot of way. It's difficult, difficult, difficult. But like I say, if I move and buy off reserve land, then the bank will look at me. And that's, I, that's how it's going to be. You know, moving away from home, buying land. Okay? I hope I answered that. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate the, the uh, information. You go back a long, lot longer in your thinking than I do, but in your opinion, do the banks do the bidding of governments or do governments do the bidding of banks? Or is there something I'm missing there that might explain it better? Thank you. You know, uh, historically, the, the Indian agent, and there's books, you could read Indian agents, uh, they were given the power right across Canada, not only on the reserve, to visit the banks. And then the national you know, headquarters where the banks were, Toronto, Winnipeg, or Montreal, and Ottawa. This, this is actually a, a, a political process. And, and some of the banks are very political. And, and so whatever uh, directive memo that they receive, do not give loans to people on reserve. They followed that. And the thing is, in the 50s, 60s, when they gave out small little loans, the Indian farmers and ranchers were paying it back. They were, they were not uh, uh, defaulting payment. But this whole thing, like I say, if they get too rich, then we can't control them. We got to you know, put them under the frying pan with the lid on. And there's documentation to that. There's one book, uh, 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 Clearing the Plains, James uh, Dashchuk, I think. Read that book. It's got a lot of documents in there, purposely to, I guess, dis make us disappear. Barb Phillips, thank you, Mike. You have, you have really enlightened me because I have, I take a lot of your story kind of personally into my own family. My dad emigrated from England in 1929. Within a month of arriving in Calgary, he had a job at St. Paul's. His title was farm instructor because he'd come from a farm in England. 
anyway, he worked there seven years, and now it sounds like, well, uh, yeah, that kind of fell off the rails. Uh, so when exactly did the government or whoever decide that First Nations people could not farm? Yeah, as I mentioned, right around the 50s, mid 60s, even though they were farming all of a sudden. And so there's a contradictory here on the treaty. Education, ranching, farming. So they built all these boarding schools. The first one here in the south, Dunbo, boarding school at the confluence close to it, Highwood River and Bow River and Calgary. Imagine the word industrial school. To, to bring out all these people, no more buffalo hunters, they're gonna be farmers and ranchers. Well, that started happening, training us, you know, my uncles, my grandfather, to be farmers. All that, third generation, second, third, and all of a sudden stopping. And his farm instructors all over the place. Well, look at about 50, 80 years of teaching us to farm, and then they pull it out from under you. Imagine, imagine. You couldn't farm, and you got all the training. But you see a white fellow come in with their tractor seeder, seeding time, harvest time, and you're looking out your window, sitting on your couch, it's not a good name, but they gave themselves, geez, they made us into armchair farmers. Looking at the very acreage right by your house being plowed by somebody else that you used to plow, that you used to seed. So all that fraction, they've created a wrongdoing. And I like one of these days, take them on the ranching and farming, especially the farming. You lied to us and you did not keep the treaty obligation. You did not fulfill it. And treaty is a really big word. We don't farm today, except my three buddies. Roy, you get to be the last question because I need to ask one as well, so. <laughs> Mike, thanks for your presentation today. It's very a real eye opener. Um, I'm wondering, just switching over to uh, kind of human services or social services, can you speak to whether or not there has been um, a successful transition in? the indigenous people, the Blackfoot people, taking back um, autonomy over their children and families, uh, family services, child protection, that sort of um, thing. Thank, Thank you. you. As I mentioned, I'm a residential school survivor. My generation, only a few of us left. So you take the generations of, of four generations of residential school being taken away from your parents. And then, then you take the 1960s scoop where children were taken away and placed off the reserve. Well, yes, we're starting to take our children back, but the new boarding school is social development off the reserve federally and provincially still placing our kids off reserve foster homes. At, some are right at birth, some elementary age, that don't know nothing about their culture, their parents. And we're calling that the modern residential school. Sure, it's not, uh, uh, in terms of numbers, that high, but it's still there. It's still there. We are still losing kids, even though child protection, they're fighting, the leaders are fighting all across Canada to keep children on the reserves, to keep them. But 
We have people living off the reserve, renting, and they don't take, take care of children or whatever accusation they face. Their children are in non-native foster homes. Let me tell you a sad story. A few years ago, there was a social service event down at Hoopup, Fort Hoopup. And it was dancing. And everybody that had a foster child tried to dress them up, a little bit Indian, ribbon shirt, whatever. There's three little girls, look like they're all sisters. They're standing by the fort there, their head down, totally shy. And a big guy, I don't know what he was saying, about four of us thought, what the heck's going on? All those girls either were dressed uh, like Mennonites or, uh, uh, you know, Dutch. They had bonnets. Now they were dressed. It wasn't Blackfoot. They were dressed like another culture. And four of us got up and this guy giving him heck. He was a big guy. And I approached him, why are you swearing at these Indian girls? Oh, they're my pastor Charlie. I could tell no way. This is a public event. Let's go outside the fort. You swear at me. His face all turned and grumbling. And I told those girls, take your bonnets off. Then they let their hair just all, you know, just go instead of a bun. Then they joined the crowd. Imagine that. You talk about forced assimilation, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that's exactly what it was. And there's still foster homes like that off the res, you know. And there should be a study. And these kids, when they turn 18, some of them are landing on the street here. No money to be made on them. And they don't know their culture, their language. They're not finishing high school, some of them. They're over there. And that's true. That's factual. So we always have the top end of the stick. This is 2022. And I think, when is the world going to change? It's up to you people. We talk reconciliation, it's up to the city. It's up to all these government, uh, federal, provincial departments to change their mandates and their attitudes and their racism. That's where it's gonna change. And hopefully today, I could change 0.5%, hopefully. I thought I'd give us a little fun thing. My name's Ian Hurdle. We've all been enjoying this delightful weather, and it happens around the temperate areas of the world, and there's various names for it. I just want to know whether we can still call it Indian summer. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll let that, you know, so uh, don't let any, uh, Academians that are too, too much to the right, I guess, <laughs> or feds or anybody. But, uh, you know, our word is mokoi, uh, mokoi, uh, the fall weather. I've always wondered about the Indian summer, where it came from. I don't know where it came from. Really, I don't. So I'm not going to really question it. I'll just let it be. I don't know where it came from. Like my grandpa to say, ah, oh, chicky, ah, oh, Indian summer, you know, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> I really don't know, and I, I know the state, some parts, tribes, don't, they don't like it, you know. But I'll handle it and lean a little bit because we're off the reserve. <laughs> Um, Mike, um, I would like you to give us a little take-home message before you wind this thing up. Uh, but I just want to mention that if you could touch upon, there's been a couple of court cases in the last few years that's gone your way. Well, most court cases go your way uh, anyway, but you had, there's a very big settlement 
when they took your cattle away and also you own the land or you land includes all the way to the US border which was previously not recognized could you touch upon that without elaborating too far and then give us a little ho take home message yeah so just uh, um on on the the land the uh land claims thing 134 year old case and they had their formulas numbers and all that and people say no your leaders back then gave the land away we never did so that was the other reason 1980 i ran to ottawa was uh you know the treaties not being fulfilled in our land claim and then we had a peaceful uh, uh demonstration uh in uh, july of 1980 and I almost got shot, all of us. <clears throat> Army, SWAT team, everybody. The police let their dogs on the elders. We had one elder later, her cap was almost hanging down. A peaceful protest in Southern Alberta. But you could see the attitudes, get them Indians off the road. Well, I got on council 2014 or 2011 to 2016 I brought the courthouse, Queen's Bench, to stand off with counsel and the chief of the day. We had the hearings. The judge ruled in our favor. And who's appealing it? The federal government. The federal government. He's a, they're appealing. And Trudeau just shook all our hands. Old and the young one, too. The young one. Uh, he's, he's, you know, the federal department is is, is appealing this, but I, I I'm I, I'm not going to run for nothing to Ottawa, and it better be in our favor. And everybody's saying it's in your favor. It's just slowing down the process. And so, right to the border. And it was on council and there's still discussions having our own border crossing. Us, our ID, our, our uh, status card, whatever. Because right now, I, I'm glad they left it up. I could go to Browning, come back to Montana. I have a tough time getting home. <laughs> I'm from Canada, you got this, 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 yeah. Jeez, maybe I should just stay at home, but I like challenging things. <laughs> and what's the other point? Uh, the cattle settlement. Oh yeah, the cattle settlement in council that I started, you know, not negotiating, but the previous councillors and especially our time in 2011, 2016, all these wrongdoings. And so even bring it to court back then, bring it to court again, it took about, what, 12 years, 10 years? The cattle that were sold illegally by the superintendent, giving a small portion back to the tribe of the day, the leaders, and taking the rest. It's like the priest, if the priest is not abusing you, it's the superintendent robbing you. And so these are old claims that we're smart enough to calculate, geez, where did all this cattle go? Where'd the money go? Because it sure wasn't put into our trust funds way back then. So we're getting legally smart, to answer the other question, we're getting legally smart financially, real estate. We're getting our act together. And like I say, you know, we're gonna change the economy, you know? And like I say, if I uh, win 70 million, I think I'll buy one whole subdivision someplace and be my subdivision, something like that. And the bank will recognize me, you know. He's got a subdivision, give him. Maybe they'll throw money at me then, I don't know. <laughs> so that's my answer. Thank you.